everybody to the uh, reading of the uh, North Carolina Veterans Alliance Foundation and the brothers and doing business as brothers and sisters like these. We're in for a real treat today. We're, our readings are going to be about uh, the Iraq-Afghan war. And uh, I would like to, at this time, introduce you to Ron Toler, which will uh, introduce the uh, foundation. Thank you, Stephen. Several years ago, Dr. Bruce Kelly, a primary care physician at the Charles George VA, recognized the need that wasn't being met. So working with Joseph Bathante, a former North Carolina poet laureate, they decided to start a writing class to encourage Vietnam veterans to write down and share their stories. After several successful classes, they decided to take the veterans to the next level by doing an oral presentation at the Asheville Community Theater. The sharing of their stories after so many years proved to be therapeutic for the veterans and very enlightening to the families friends, and the community that they shared the stories with. Because of the success of the first classes, several more classes have been conducted, and Dr. Kelly's classes have been recognized as best practices by the VA. Now his template is being used across the state and region to benefit more Vietnam veterans. Several of the original veterans veteran writers wanted to continue the classes and to include veterans of later conflicts, including Desert Storm, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The North Carolina Veterans Writing Alliance, a 501c3 nonprofit, was established to carry on their work and include more veterans. This spring, the first mixed class of Vietnam veterans Desert Storm and Iraq veterans were conducted, and you will hear some of the stories tonight that have come from these classes. The mixed class forms such a bond that they have continued to write and share their stories on a bi-weekly basis. Now we'll turn it back over to Steve to let him tell you more about brothers and sisters like these. Brothers and Sisters Like These was uh, set up to help uh, all veterans and family members and uh, of all ages to overcome their demons, PTSD and mild TBI. And uh, it has worked tremendously for those that have been through the program. And we would like to invite any uh, brothers and sisters out there that uh, wish to go through their program, or even in some cases like today, we have, we're have we honored to have a Gold Star mother, and we would like to invite uh, any Gold Star parents or family members uh, to join our, our writing group and go through classes. Uh, I would like to say that we have uh, performed all across the state of North Carolina in reading about uh, trauma and reading about healing and reading about the things uh, that make us positive from the day we started this program. I would like to invite all age groups. I would like to invite people from all walks of life and, uh, and we can adapt the program to you. So please contact the North Carolina Veterans Writing Alliance and, uh, and join brothers and sisters like these at this time. I would like to uh, introduce our first reader, which will be uh, Stacy Lissenberger. Thank you, Steve. Um, so for today, I just have my um, stable, solid, um, oldie but goodie. And so in the future, I'll have um, a couple new stories, but this is my um, fallback one. So again, this story is from my first deployment as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And again, this mission left from Bob Spiker. 
So in September of 2005, the U.S. Army was going out into the rural areas of Iraq and conducting humanitarian missions. These were called MEDCAP missions and were conducted by the Battalion Aid Station and the Civil Affairs Unit. I was invited along as the units knew me as an occupational therapist in the Combat Stress Detachment and my work at the Combat Support Hospital, the CASH. My mission as an OT was to fit a 12-year-old boy with polio in a wheelchair. His dad was asking for surgery to fix him, and our team explained that this was not possible and why. In these rural areas, or in these rural villages, the citizens had no real knowledge of medical issues. I did the wheelchair fitting and taught the father how to transfer him. For 12 years, this boy had been carried everywhere by his father. I asked our leadership if I could wander around the outside of the large home to look around. I was given permission and started taking pictures of the children playing outside and of the village trying to gather to catch a glimpse of us. We were quite a sight with our Humvees all locked and loaded, with 50 caliber weapons, guards, and a team of devoted medical providers and other professionals ready to give a full day of medical assistance. I was dressed in full battle rattle, consisting of my helmet, my protective vest, M16, and a full cam combat load of ammo. It was at least 125 degrees outside, and I was soaking wet with sweat. Soon the gather, Soon the group of gathered Iraqi women motioned to me to come over to them, and next I was welcomed into the kitchen in their common area. They were really interested in me. Once seated inside, they motioned to take my camera, and they had started looking it over and taking pictures. I imagined they had never seen a camera before or even used it. Then true to Middle Eastern tradition, they started to want to give me all kinds of items. They were super curious if I, I was really a female, and fortunately, they did not want proof. I figured I could give them answers to their questions, and I left to get the male Iraqi interpreter. I asked him if he could go into their living area, and he said yes. While with the women, we answered all of their questions, and I left with only one gift. As we left the room, the translator kept saying, Thank you, over and over again in Arabic. Shukran, shukran. I finally asked him why. He explained how as an Iraqi male, he was never allowed in the women's area. However, with me, he was seen as a translator and he could help me out. He was so pleased. I joined in, I left and I joined my, Ameri my army team to eat at a big plastic white table and chairs. Our guards came in and took quick turns to eat and were grateful for a few minutes out of their hot, heavy gear. The meal was traditional Middle Eastern, an entire cooked lamb on, with rice on huge platters. The Iraqi men served us by grabbing huge fistfuls of food and literally dumping it on our plates. While we ate, they masterfully grabbed more food and threw it again onto our plates. There was no saying no. I had rice in my hair from all the flying food, and when they, when they broke the lamb apart, the grease would splatter into our faces. We were all laughing. Once we were completely full, the Iraqi men sat on the floor to eat their meal. As we left for the day, I enjoyed my role as, a young, as helping a young child become more independent and meeting the Iraqi women and the girls. I hope that coming to the village would inspire the girls to dream for more, to see firsthand how women serve proudly in the US military and sit with the men. Oh, and my gift, it was a really ornate bra. <laughs> the end. Thank you, Stacy. that was, I love that story. Thank you so much. Y'all are Just, good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, would I miss y'all. <laughs> Miss you too. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask Ann Atkins to uh, share her story as, about Matthew. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. My name is Ann Atkins, and I was asked to speak with you today because I am a Gold Star mother. And while I'm very glad to be with you virtually on this special day, I 
I'm a bit nervous, but you know what? I think I'm with a very special group of people who will understand if maybe I just shed a little tear for our beloved son, Matthew, who was killed in Iraq on May the 3rd, 2007. As for Matthew, it was so obvious to us when he was growing up, his attachment to the military. The first toys he wanted were toy soldiers, then tanks, then more soldiers, then more tanks. And once when he was a tyke, he was watching the History Channel, which was always his, his, his favorite channel, and raced in to tell us what horrible people the Nazis were. Yes, they were just terrible people. But, boy, they did have some snappy uniforms, didn't they, huh? So then he took off to watch the um, History Channel again with the Nazis, awful Nazis with their snappy uniforms. The years passed, and then came 9-11. As were we all, he was devastated and told us he wanted to join the military so that this kind of event would never happen to our country again. But we said no, he needed to finish college and then join the military. But he continued to talk to us about joining and then one day he came home and he said, Mama, I love you so much, but I'm joining the army. I have to fight for my country, I'm joining. And we finally understood his dedication. And while scared, we were also proud of his love for his country. But to jump ahead just a little bit, what we did not understand was his return to Iraq after only two months home from his first tour. He called and said he had volunteered to go back so that veterans who had families would have more time to spend with those families. He said it was the right thing to do and that someday someone would do the same for him. His commitment to his country and the military was absolutely total. His first leave home, he asked if we could please go to New York and we did. Naturally, the first place he wanted to go immediately after landing was ground zero. And when we arrived, he stood there and he looked at it for so long, I could not imagine what he was seeing and thinking. And then I saw one lone tear roll down his face. Then he turned to me and he hugged me so hard. And he said, Mama, there are some things worth dying for. And that's my country and my family. And then came May the 3rd, 2007, the day we became part of a club no parent wants to belong to. I was in bed and my husband Vernon came in with a look of disbelief and shock on his face and said three words I'm never gonna forget. He said, we've lost Matthew. No, 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 he had to be wrong. That, that couldn't happen. But when I saw the emotion on the sergeant and chaplain's faces, then it hit me, it was for real. Pain such as I have never experienced shot through me. It was the greatest agony I have ever felt, my head was screaming, no, 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 no. And then my body and the mind and self-defense just shut down, literally shut down. It was the only way I could deal with it. And this went on for months and then stopped. I thawed and every day was a nightmare. You should not have to bury your child, never. Did I think about killing myself to end the pain? Yep, I sure did. Sure did, many times, and might have, but for my wonderful husband and my wonderful daughter. And during that time, one thing I learned is that men and women grieve very differently. Vernon seemed so much more composed than I did immediately after Matthew's death. I couldn't understand why he wasn't grieving like me. And then one day I was downstairs cleaning and I heard a noise and, and I, ran, I ran and found Vernon crying so hard he finally let it out. He finally began to show his pain and grief. And you know, after that, we were able to talk and understand our sadness. Thank God we learned to help each other through that awful time and we continue to do that for each other. I continued to work for a few years after Matthew's death, but one day I was in a meeting listening to our CEO yell at everybody and then it hit me. Boy, I sure don't belong here anymore. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be helping veterans. So I quit. 
and began volunteering at veterans organizations. And after we moved to North Carolina, I was very lucky and very honored to be asked on the board of Blue Ridge Honor Flight and Veterans Healing Farm. But after quitting my job and working for veterans, something so important happened to me. It was so important. I had a realization. I was looking at baby pictures of Matthew and then I looked outside at some beautiful blooming trees and it hit me how very, very lucky we have. We were to have had our boy for 24 years. What if I'd never had him? We were so blessed to have our boy for that long. Another thing I've learned is that the military is a family. You gain new friends and sons that become like your own. They stay with you, they come for holidays, but they're not always happy times. One day I received a call from Matthew's dear friend who said, Mama, I just had to call you and tell you how much I love you, but I can't go on like this. I can't live like this any longer. I'm sorry, Mama, I can't live like this any longer. And I don't know where it came from. Maybe God was with me or it was just my true honest feelings, I guess, but I said, Daniel, I don't think that's a good idea at all. I don't think I can stand to lose another son. And he's a long silence and he said, Mama, I didn't think of that. We got him the help he needed and he is better and he's still our adopted son. I've had two calls like that and they're real scary, but in each instance was able to help. I was really, really glad of that, that somehow I said the right thing and they felt like they could call me for help. Then another healing came from two of Matthew's best friends who were with him in the army. They called me and they were crying and they said it had taken them 12 years to call and tell me this and they were so sorry, but they were ready now. They said they'd all gone to church the day of Matthew's death. Later that day, they were by his side when he died and said it was very important to tell me what happened. He took their hands, he smiled at them and he said, I'm not afraid. And he closed his eyes, took a last breath and died. And after he died, he continued to smile. He was okay, he was fine. It's taken me a long and painful journey but I finally have realized that our son Matthew died where he chose to be, doing what he chose to do. Now think about that. How many of us are ever gonna be able to say that? Do I still suffer from anxiety and regret? Yeah, but I'm better. And I'm getting help from some wonderful new veterans friends who suffer from the same afflictions and we can talk. Also helping veterans helps so much. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. I so wanted you to know that the things I've shared with you today have given a new life back to me. It's not a life without pain, depression, and anxiety, but you know what? It's a life I can live with. My sincere thanks to all of you out there, especially veterans and everyone watching and honoring and remembering and showing their respect to our country's heroes. And finally, one more time, thank you so very, very much for letting me tell you the story of our beautiful son's life and his death from this world. God bless you all. Thank you, Anne. It's such a, a wonderful, you had such a wonderful son and I thank you for sharing that with us. And thank and, you. And I thank you for sharing us about your beautiful family and about uh, Matthew's friends and what you've, been able to be in your family been able to do to help them thank you so much thank you uh, at this time i'd like to ask tommy cannon if he'd read his piece hello my name's tommy cannon i served 14 years in the u.s army infantry uh, the piece i'd like to read is highs and lows my second deployment to iraq was an interesting one 
As an active duty infantry unit, our sole purpose is to close with and destroy the enemy. But not this time. Our company will be tasked with convoy security, making sure that critical supplies make it to their intended destination. As a squad leader, I would be in charge of roughly 25 soldiers and 30 or more civilian contractors while we were on mission. From my experience in my previous deployment, this should be relatively calm. The 8th of November, 2006, was a night that I would prove myself wrong. The highs and lows of that night would be greater than most of them. We started on a little trip up north that would take us an hour or four, depending on if the EOD or the engineers were out on the road. We had a line of gun trucks and semi trucks that stretched to almost two miles. Heading up to Spiker was always a challenge, but it was a nice place to get to hang out for a day before we got back to business. We were maybe 20 minutes into our journey when my lead truck, which was an armored security vehicle and capable of surviving IED blasts much better than Humvees, he came up on the radio. They stayed roughly five to 800 meters in front of my truck looking for possible bombs. Mike called up and said, dead dog left. At that moment, there was a tremendous explosion. I watched the burning hulk of that vehicle take a 90 degree turn while flying through the air like an evil Knievel jump. I had to push the convoy forward for several reasons. We need to get out of the kill zone. And I have my medic, a truck with two EMTs, and an LMTV that had a large fire suppression system on it further back in the convoy. As we bore down on that fire and destruction, my driver said, what do I do? I told him to hit the gas and I pulled my gunner into the truck. I took another look at that truck when we went by and directed the right trucks to break off and get there as fast as possible. I knew that one of my best friends and two of my amazing soldiers were dead. The impact the bomb had on that truck was absolutely devastating. We continued forward until everyone was either at the down truck or out of the kill zone. As I was reporting and getting reports, I thought of my soldiers' families and what I would say to them. A few moments later, I hear Mike on the radio. He said, if somebody can get this fire out, we can get out. We are okay. I never raised my voice during combat. No, no matter the situation I was in, I always was able to stay calm. This is the one time I think I did. I yelled into that radio with joy. We got you, brother. Have you out in a second. I watched heroes save their brother's lives that night. Burnt uniforms and burnt boots belong to these brave men putting out the fire and saving their brothers from burning alive. We got them out and made sure that they were okay. As I got back in my truck, Casey looked over at me with wide eyes and said, Sergeant Cannon, I crapped my pants. I looked at him and laughed. I told him that I was happy I didn't eat dinner that night. I'm so thankful that those men survived, and I'm so thankful for the heroes that helped them get out of that truck. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. You you really took us there step by step and what went on, and we appreciate that. And what a moving story. Thank you so much. This time, I'd like to ask Alton Whitley to read his piece. I was uh, retired from the Air Force after 26 years. 
I spent most of my career flying fighter and attack aircraft and accumulated over 5,000 hours. So there were a thousand of that being in combat. Early in my career, I served two tours in the Vietnam War. On the first, I flew the legendary F-100 Super Saber, and on the second tour, the very capable A-7 Corsair. But Stephen, I want to share a couple of my experiences from Desert Storm flying the F-117A, America's first stealth fighter. When the Lockheed Skunk Works test pilots and others uh, had already uh, while well, they had flown and been involved in initial testing of the F-117 uh, before I flew the airplane, uh, I was the first operational pilot to fly the aircraft on the 15th of October, 1982. I remained with that unit until June of 1985, and I left for a series of uh, five different assignments, with the last one being as a director of fighter training and tactics with the Tactical Air Command. In fact, I was at the end of that assignment when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in the early days of August of 1990. Within a couple of weeks, I headed off to Nevada and took command of the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, which at that time was equipped with over 50 operational stealth fighters. I'd only arrived in town the evening prior, and I'd been the commander for four hours when we got our deployment order. And when the sun rose two days later, we were getting airborne headed to Saudi Arabia. After a couple of months, uh, we got settled in with our people and got our program, training program established. My commanding officer allowed me to go back to the States and get checked out in the F-117. I hadn't flown the airplane for over five years. And the timing was such that I was I completed my check out and was ready to deploy when the second squadron went over in early December prior to the start of the war. I was 45 years old when I crawled into an airplane, was strapped in for 16 hours for a 14 and a half hour flight from uh, Virginia to Saudi Arabia. Mm. That required us to hook up to the tanker 10 different times. So I always had enough gas to get to a an emergency airfield in case we had a problem. I ended up flying 19 combat missions in Desert Storm. We were short of pilots, and almost all of our missions were five and a half to six hours long. And I'm sure there are some people on here who watched uh, Desert Storm on TV and CNN in 1991, and it was our unit that was going downtown every night. Uh, stirring things up and making your broadcast interesting. Every time we went into the target area, we encountered some intense enemy air defenses of anti-aircraft artillery or AAA and surface air missiles. Some have said the defenses around Baghdad were many more times uh, capable than those that were defending Hanoi during the Vietnam War. Some have even said the defenses around Baghdad were equivalent to those around Moscow. I can't confirm those descriptions, but I can assure you that each of those missions in the Baghdad metropolitan area or any high value target in the country would set off a fireworks display that would rival anything any of you have ever seen. Needless to say, these missions proved to be some very tense moments for those of us who were line in the middle of all of that. I'm going to give you a brief insight to just two of my missions in Desert Storm. Both were memorable for a variety of reasons, much different reasons. My first mission consisted of two attacks on two separate targets. That first attack was somewhat a humbling failure for me, and the second proved very deadly for others. On my very first attack, I was in complete awe of what was going on around me, below me, in front of me at my altitude, and well above me. I'd never seen anything like it. It made me understand why 
my commanding officer had told me just a few hours before I went out and strapped on the airplane that he expected us to lose at least six airplanes that night. Based on what I was seeing, I thought we'd lose more than that. I lost my focus momentarily. It broke my train of thought and the habit pattern I had practiced time and time again. In the heat of battle, I left out a critical step and I simply failed to select the attack mode on the weapons delivery computer. As a result, I took some beautiful pictures of my intended target, but I gave the Iraqi air defenses an opportunity to take plenty of shots at me without me inflicting any damage on them. Needless to say, I was not a happy camper. I was professionally embarrassed and extremely humbled by this error. Not only did I let myself down, but all those assigned to my unit, not just my fellow pilots, but the maintenance, the intelligence, mission planners and support personnel who had worked for months to this very moment. This oversight meant someone else was gonna to have to go after that same target the next night. It was certainly not the example I needed to set as the commanding officer. However, it's like the guy who drops the winning touchdown in the end zone when no one's around him, or drops that pop fly to lose the game. I had to suck it up, learn from my mistake, and move on to the next target. I couldn't let the last play, play determine the outcome. But I can also tell you, I have flown that attack many, many times in my mind. But unlike the first target run, my second on this mission is memorable for a different reason. Right after I released my laser guided bomb and was refining my aim point, I saw a lot of people streaming out of a door next to the point that I intended for the bomb to strike. My wingman had dropped his bomb on the other end of a rather large structure some 30 seconds earlier. It was a sector operations center, a key command and control facility in the Iraqi air defense network. Our job was to shut down this facility and take away their ability to detect and track allied aircraft, which we have successfully accomplished. But once my wingman's bomb hit, people started scrambling in a desperate attempt to survive by running out the end of the building that I was going after. Unfortunately for them, when my bottom hit exactly where I aimed, these people literally disappeared. While it was a successful attack, it almost seemed too easy. On another memorable mission, I was part of a small force that attacked targets in the far northern part of Iraq. Because we had established air superiority, our brave air refueling tankers took us 125 miles into the country. So we would have enough fuel to get to the targets and get back. As I was making a series of descending turns into my assigned target, a bright flash went off behind my airplane and the concussion turned my aircraft upside down. I rolled out wings level, checked my instruments. When everything looked okay and I didn't have any red lights coming on, I decided to press on. This certainly put the fear of God into me. While our airplanes were hard to detect and extremely hard to track on radar, we were not totally invisible. I can only assume the explosion was probably a surface to air missile since I had not observed any tracers from AAA in the Mosul area. As advanced as the F-117 was, I didn't have any type of uh, system to tell me I was being tracked by radar or that a surface-to-air missile had been launched at me. This is another mission I have flown many, many times. What anxiety, what stress, what fear, why me? Just as it was in Vietnam, I knew it was gonna be a long walk home if the bad guys got a lucky shot. For whatever reason, the good Lord allowed me to survive for reasons unknown to me. I've come to accept it wasn't luck, but God's grace had enabled me to survive so I could continue to do it. The end. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alvin.
thank you for taking us downtown Baghdad and thank you for being a leader for all those years and mastering those aircraft and taking care of your men and bringing them back home safe. We love you and we appreciate you. This time I'd like to ask Kevin Wireman if he would share his piece with us. Sure, Steve, thank you. Um, I'm going to read a, a, a brief uh, introduction and, and then a piece that we wrote in, in the class that uh, was mentioned previously uh, to the prompt of your last day home. And for me, I, I wrote it to the day that we actually left uh, the States. Uh, first of all, my name is Robert Kevin Weirman, and I most usually uh, use my middle name, Kevin. Uh, I entered the Navy's delayed enlistment program in, while a junior in high school in 1981. I served on active duty in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program from 1982 through July of 1990. That included two years of training, three years of, uh, as an instructor at a nuclear prototype, and three years in the Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine Service. I chose not to re-enlist to help raise our children. Uh, when our daughters and son were well into their high school years, I decided to finish my military career and enlisted in the Naval Reserve with the intentions of completing 11 more years to earn my retirement. I was attached to a Reserve Naval Mobile Construction Battalion, or no better known as the CBs, and in 2005, I was deployed to the Alambar province of Western Iraq, where our mission was to support the Marine 2nd Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. Less than three months upon returning to the States, I was reassigned to the Naval Coastal Warfare Inshore Boat Unit. I was immediately redeployed to the United Arab Emirates, where our mission was to protect and defend U.S. interests and ensure international shipping lanes, lanes remained operational. Uh, I was medically retired in May of 2008. <clears throat> and the piece I wrote was Flyaway Day, because that's what the CBs called the day that we left country. <laughs> Um, so there it is, Flyaway Day. I think that's what they called it. Yeah, Flyaway Day, March 13th, 2005. It seems like that day should mean something, you know, not just another day. And come to think of it, it wasn't just another day, you know. It was dull. It, no, not lacking in interest or excitement, but lacking in sharpness. That crisp, intense feeling that often accompanies and marks a historic event. But I was numb. Not that I did not or could not feel, I most definitely felt a lot of things. I just did not know how to sort them out, how to process them, quantify them, or understand them. I wandered alone in a crowd of hundreds, or perhaps I was motionless as a throng of others merely flowed around me. I did not realize then, but this experience of aloneness and being alone amongst many foretold my place in this world for years to come. There was an occasional interaction of, hey, Wehrman, any news yet? No, not yet, still waiting, I managed to respond. It is not that they were indifferent. They had their own flyaway day to live. It was still relatively early in the Iraq war debacle, and the vast majority of our battalion had never been deployed. There were a couple dozen on the advance party that had ventured over out a week or so ago to make sure our comfy robes and slippers were at the ready, the beds would be turned back, and we'd have mints on the pillows when we got there. So at this point, it was like watching a circus show with each CB, a ringmaster in their own tent, desperately seeking to put on a good show for their family, friends, or whomever might step under the big top to take a peek. Whether they realized it or not, the family and friends all had their parts too. And in most cases, they appeared to have rehearsed them quite well and knew their lines. <clears throat> Actually, it was quite amazing to observe. My show played out via telephone, flip phones, that day's version of a smartphone, I guess. Yeah, phones, lots of phones and lots of confusion. See, I was physically located on a tarmac in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, waiting to board a plane over to the sandbox and passionately praying that I'd received one of the round trip tickets. So with my boots on the ground in Huntsville, my entire being was captivated by what was going on in a little hospital room in Hendersonville, North Carolina. It was there that my immediate family had gathered. I had known to see me off. My oldest child, 
daughter Hannah had been in labor for quite some time and was going to give birth to my second grandchild at any moment. The confusion with so many people around me and so many conversations taking place at once was contributing to my anxiety. <clears throat> we were all crowded around the plane and could not leave the area because we would be boarding at any minute. The background noise, the drop calls, and the connections of extreme poor quality were infuriating. Combined with the interruptions of well-intentioned quick questions tossed at me by a passerby or, by, or to my wife or daughter in the hospital added to the confusion, the anxiety, the anger, and the fear. I was terrified that I may not know anything before I was forced to climb <laughs> the long stairs into that ugly submarine that had somehow sprouted wings and jet engines. I could not bear the thought of riding that thing halfway around the world, all the time my heart and soul anchored in a tiny hospital room in Hendersonville, wondering what had occurred. Was everyone okay? How would I know? Who would tell me? What if it was not okay? What if I had to go back? What if the Navy wouldn't let me go back? Then by the grace of God, it was over. <clears throat> My wife Allison told me it was a boy, and both he and Hannah were fine. I finally spoke to Hannah and briefly, and I told her that I loved her and was so happy for her. I said my goodbye and my I love yous to Allison and to Hannah. <clears throat> we thank God for the health of our child, our grandchild. I turned off my phone for the last time, and all had happened so fast, literally a blur. After that, word spread like California wildfire. People swarmed around me to shake my hand and congratulate me. Then it abruptly ended with the command, fall in. Once in formation, I heard a bunch of stuff that sounded like Charlie Brown's school teacher. Then my name, Weirman. Then my name again, Weirman. I finally managed to answer it up with a here, sir and our commanding officer strolled through the, through the ranks and came to rest in front of me. I hear that this is a big day for you, he said with a big smile and almost a chuckle. Yes, sir, I replied. My own smile had barely, barely contained within the confines of my face as I stated, first, it's my birthday. I'm 41 <laughs> today. Second, my firstborn daughter, <laughs> Just, and I mean just gave birth to my second grandchild, and they're both healthy. And third, I'm going to Iraq. I paused briefly and followed up with a, well, sir, two out of three ain't bad. He maintained his big smile, and it even grew a bit. And I know I heard a laugh as he strode away, <laughs> shaking his head. And that, my friends, is about as good as a flyaway day can get. The end. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin, for taking us to your last day before leaving. We appreciate you, and we've watched your writings grow, and we've watched you heal, and it means a lot to us. At this time, I would like to ask Gabriel Garcia if he would share his piece with us. Yes, hi, I'm Gabriel Garcia. I'm a chaplain resident currently at the Charles George VA Medical Center. Um, I'm also a captain in the North Carolina National Guard. Uh, but prior to that, I spent four years in the reserves. And prior to that, I spent almost four years on active duty um, in Korea, one year there, and then uh, with the 82nd Airborne. Uh, and I also deployed with them. Uh, today, I'd like to share a poem I wrote called One of These Boots, um, and this was based off of Memorial Day 2015, which was the first Memorial Day since coming home from Afghanistan. These were my thoughts when I saw thousands of boots on a football field in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Each boot had a small American flag along with an ID tag of the photo, name, and date of when that service member died overseas. This picture, I have a picture attached to this poem, cannot fit the over 7,000 boots that is growing each year since 2001. This photo also cannot describe the emotions that hit me when I walked up and down the rows of boots and saw the names, faces, and dates that were on these boots. 
There are over 20 boots from the day I left, my, my flyaway date, uh, December 6, 2013, to the day I returned home safely, uh, August 25th, a few days before my dad's birthday of 2014. Thousands of names, stories, pain, and tears are on these boots. This poem is dedicated to every soldier, Marine, airman, sailor, and coast guardsman that are one of these boots. One of these boots. A flag, a photo, and a name, and a date are all on one boot. A memory, a story, a laugh, and a cry are all on one boot. A son, a husband, and a friend are all on one boot. A daughter, a sister, and a nurse are all on one boot. A hero, a Medal of Honor recipient, a book, and a movie are all on one boot. A crew, a team, a crash, and a tragedy are all in a group of boots. A son of a command sergeant major, a Simone family, and their traditional attire and art are all displayed on one boot. A husband who was transferred bases to be with his wife on Christmas, who was killed two days later, is on a boot. A highly decorated airborne ranger with over 30 years of military service and multiple combat deployments is on a boot. A two-star general who was killed in an insider attack is on a boot. Two paratroopers killed in an insider attack within days of arriving in country are on a pair of boots. A senior enlisted paratrooper who went home in a flag draped coffin and placed in the back of a C-17 cargo plane is on a boot. Seeing the names, the faces, the dates that are on these boots made me realize that I could have been one of these boots. The end. And thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe. And we really appreciate that poem. It's so beautiful and so, so true. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, especially Ann Atkins and all of us can, can know the names on those boots. Yes. And, and I want to say what that four of our readers today were in our last uh, class before COVID and they were our younger vets or vets that served in Iraq and Afghan because uh, Alton doesn't like me calling him one of our younger vets. But uh, <laughs> at the time, I would like to ask that, uh, that Ron uh, Toller, uh, maybe he wants to say some comments about our each of our readings and maybe give you information on how you can sign up for a, a class uh, so you can uh, get some peace from uh, your uh, wounds for more. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we are currently working on starting another class and we envision it being another mixed group with Vietnam and Iraq, Afghan, Desert Storm veterans all together. Uh, that has been very successful for us in the past. And as I said before, uh, the initial group have formed a, a strong bond and we continue to write and share our stories. Uh, right now, we are thinking about the possibility of September, but with the COVID situation, um, it's almost a day-by-day -day situation. We have a location, uh, but we are also considering doing a Zoom uh, class. And I've, uh, we've had several veterans, uh, including Gabriel Garcia, that have expressed interest in taking the class with us. And we are seriously looking at a Zoom situation for that. So um, at this point in time, if you are interested, there, uh, the easiest way to contact us would be to send me an email. Uh, my uh, email address is the number one treehouse, T-R-E-E-H-O-U-S-E, -E -E, at charter.net. And 
Just tell me who you are and that you're interested and we will proceed from there and I will put you on the list and, and give you as much information as I can. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that Tommy Cannon has set up for us and is working with and you can uh, contact us through the Facebook page if you would like. Um, Steve, I believe that's pretty much all that we, you know, I have to say at this time about it. Uh, we look forward to having as many people as we can and uh, look forward to hearing from people. And before we go off today, I'd like to ask Tommy if he would tell uh, just a little bit about the Facebook page he set up and, and uh, uh, also we have a, a web page that's coming, coming out very soon. And maybe he could go over that just very briefly. Uh, as far as the Facebook page goes, it is, uh, I mean, it's just a standard Facebook page, but my goal with that is to try to reach out to other veterans and their families and also keep our, our events that are coming up uh, current on the page and get as many people involved as possible. Thank you, Tommy. Mary Beth, would you like to say something about our face, uh, website? Sure. Um, hoping that we're gonna get the last finishing touches on that this week and hopefully get it launched next week. Um, it will be brothersandsisterslikethese.com. And this is a place where you can um, not only find out about what events are coming up, what regular support groups are happening, um, how you can sign up for classes, but also um, you can purchase the book, Brothers, and si Brothers Like These, um, from the website. The website's going to have a lot of information about our history and um, pictures and things like that and, and some stories some stories like what you heard tonight so i think it'll be very beneficial for all those who visit thank you mary beth okay at this time does anyone have anything uh, a closing comment they'd like to make if if not we'll uh, go off the air this has been taped and it will be uh place where you can look at it on YouTube at a later date.